we're going to be examining the existence of public goods as an example of a market failure. In previous lessons of this unit we have established a definition for market failure. A market failure exists anytime the provision of a good by the free market is greater than or less than the socially optimal level. Socially optimal output is determined when the marginal social benefit, in other words, all the benefits enjoyed by society as a whole from a goods provision, are equal to the marginal social costs, in other words, the costs imposed on society in the provision of a good. Some of the market failures we've already examined in this unit include negative externalities of production and consumption when a good is overproduced by the free market due to harmful effects that the goods production or consumption has on third parties. We've also looked at positive externalities of production and consumption when a good is underproduced by the free market due to the positive spillover benefits that the goods production or consumption has on third parties. To understand a public good, we have to take a slightly different approach because public goods are not over or underproduced by the free market. Rather, they are not produced at all by the free market. A public good is an extreme version of a good with positive externalities of production or consumption, in which case goods are underproduced by the free market. Goods such as health care and public transportation and education are underprovided by the free market, but there are private providers of health care, of schooling, and of transportation. The role of government in these markets is to encourage or incentivize greater levels of production of these goods in order to benefit society as a whole. Public goods have a very particular definition, however. A public good is one that is both non-rivalrous and non-excludable meaning that there is no incentive for private firms to provide this good. Let's clarify what is meant by non-rivalrous and non-excludable here. These are the two defining characteristics of public goods and we will use an example here to illustrate what makes public goods both non-rivalrous and non-excludable. The example I'm going to be focusing on today throughout the rest of this lesson is the all too common street lamp. Street lamps or street lights like that which we see here on the right are to be found everywhere in cities in the rich world. These goods provide benefits to individuals and to society as a whole. However, the benefits enjoyed by an individual from the existence of a street lamp are what we call non-rivalrous. What this means is that the benefits provided by public good can be enjoyed by any individual without infringing on the benefits of other individuals. In other words, the benefits of street lamps and other public goods are non-rivalrous. Another common example of a public good is national defense. Let's talk about what national defense and street lamps have in common. If you live in a town that has lots of street lamps, that means that when you walk down the street at night, you benefit from the light provided by those street lamps. However, your enjoyment of those lights do not limit the enjoyment of others who walk down the same streets at night. In the same way, when national defense is provided by a military, the benefit enjoyed by one individual within that country does not infringe on the benefits enjoyed by other individuals. The benefits of both defense and street lights are therefore non-rivalrous. Me benefiting from a street lamp on a dark city street does not limit other people's enjoyment of the benefits of that street lamp. The opposite of non-rivalrous, obviously, is rivalrous. An example of a good that is rivalrous in consumption is a smartphone. If I own a Samsung smartphone, the benefits of that smartphone are rivalrous, meaning that when I use that smartphone, nobody else in society benefits from its use. When I'm listening to music or browsing Facebook on my smartphone, my neighbors, my friends, others around me do not benefit at all. Hence, the benefits of a private good, such as smartphones, are rivalrous. One person's enjoyment of the good definitely infringes on the other person's enjoyment of the good. Public goods do not have this characteristic. However, they are non-rivalrous, meaning that the benefits can be enjoyed by all in society without diminishing anybody else's benefits. The second defining characteristic of a public good is that it must be non-excludable. This means that once the good is provided, 
no individuals in society can be excluded from its benefits. Think about the street lamp. Once a city has installed street lamps and they are turned on at night, no individual can be excluded from using that service. Somebody who doesn't even live in that city but comes to visit benefits from the provision of those lights. So the definition of a public good is that it is both non-rivalrous and non-excludable. Both defense and street lamps fit these definitions. What makes defense not excludable is that anybody living within the borders of a country with a military protecting it cannot be excluded from the protection provided by that military. Let's compare the non-excludable nature of public goods to the excludable nature of private goods. We'll use my smartphone example again. If Samsung builds smartphones in a factory in Korea, it can easily exclude certain individuals from enjoying the benefits of those smartphones because in order to enjoy those benefits, an individual must buy the smartphone. It is easy to charge individuals for a smartphone because you must go into a shop or order one online and without putting down a credit card or putting some cash out, you cannot take the smartphone home. In contrast, it is impossible to charge individuals for the use of a public good. Once the street lamps have been turned on, you can't suddenly make them turn off when certain individuals who haven't helped pay for those street lamps walks down the street. So to recap, our definition of a public good is one that is both non-rivalrous and non-excludable. So how do these characteristics lead to a market failure? Because individuals cannot easily be charged for the benefits and because the benefits enjoyed by one can be enjoyed by all, private firms will not find it profitable to produce and supply public goods. Of course, this leads to the name of these goods, which is public goods. Because these goods will simply not be provided by the free market, in other words, by the private sector, the public sector is left to provide these goods. So because of this, these goods typically must be provided by government or the public sector. The characteristics of public goods as being both non-excludable and non-rivalrous gives rise to something we call the free rider problem. The free rider problem refers to the situation in which individuals do not report their full demand for a good in order to avoid having to pay for it. In this way, individuals might benefit from the existence of goods such as street lamps and defense without ever having to help pay for them in any way. Let's go back to our example of street lamps here. If a company were to erect street lamps and then try to charge individuals for using those street lamps on a per use basis, it could put out a donation box at the end of the street on which the street lamps are erected. Individuals who are totally honest about how much benefit and use they get out of the street lamps would, in theory, drop money into the box every time they walk down that street. However, it would be very easy to free ride. Once the street lamps are provided, individuals do not have any incentive to pay for them. Hence, the free rider problem exists. Once a public good has been provided, it's almost impossible to charge individuals for its use. Everybody else would benefit from them without having to pay. Hence, the market failure that is public goods. Due to the non-excludability and non-rivalrous nature of public goods, the market simply does not provide these goods, and the equilibrium output of zero will be less than the socially optimal output of something greater than zero. Without government provision, public goods simply will not be provided. In the next part of this lesson, we're going to look more closely at our street lamp example, and we'll examine some marginal benefit and marginal cost data to come up with a graphical illustration of the market failure that is public goods. Here we go.